Good morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third in our series of the Dean's webinars entitled Business as Unusual. Today, we're going to be talking about resilience in a crisis. In an age of uncertainty, it's become harder than ever for us to predict what's going to happen next. The very best forecasters and experts in forecasting say that it's impossible to see more than 400 days out. And that's if you're outstanding, you're impartial, and you're prepared to keep revising your forecasts. For the rest of us mere mortals, it's really about 100 to 150 days. So much as we might wish, we really cannot see the future. And what that means is that much will happen to us that we simply do not see coming. Think of the companies that used to manufacture plastic straws. Think of travel agents. Think of the companies that produce live events or consider the National Health Service. Uncertainty is an eradicable aspect of life and business these days, whether we like it or not. So resilience matters because it is our capacity to bounce back from an unanticipated events, from traumas, from shocks, from surprises. And it has really two faces. What is it about some organizations that enables them to weather these crises, sometimes even emerging stronger than they started, while others simply fold and collapse? Why are some much better at changing fast while others stay stuck in old outmoded business models, unable to see that they're gradually becoming irrelevant? It's a question every single business leader is asking today. So what does it take for a company to be resilient? And does your company have enough of it? But there's a personal side to resilience too. How do we as individuals whether the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that life throws at us? How do we rebound when our career plans, our work environment, our friends and colleagues all change completely or their circumstances change overnight? We knew going into the pandemic that mental health was already at a crisis stage in most organizations, but how much more so now? What can we do as individuals, as colleagues, or as friends, or as leaders to contribute to the health and the well being of our friends, of our colleagues, and of our, com our companies? So there is plenty to talk about. And I'm fortunate to be joined today by four exceptional individuals, all with their own perspective, insights, and lived experience during this difficult time. As we're talking, I'd ask you please to enter your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And I'll be turning to those once I've had a chance to talk to each of our four panelists. I'm going to start with Veronica Hope Haley. Veronica was until last year, the Dean of the School of Management here at the University of Bath. And she remains, I hope in perpetuity as an emeritus professor at the school. At, during the financial crisis, Veronica did a really landmark piece of work looking at the state of trust that companies enjoyed or didn't enjoy when they went into the crisis and what the consequences were for the outcomes of those businesses. And now in this new, very different kind of crisis, her research has returned to that topic to see what, if anything, has changed and what, if anything, we might have learned. So I wanted to start off with what might seem a bit of an obvious question, which is what is it that makes a crisis so very demanding of trust in our leaders? Uh, in a crisis, if you think about it, if you think about the crisis at the moment, you've got leaders at the top of organizations dealing with without data, without certainty, and with huge amounts of risk, and what they're having to do is to ask employees, in some cases, to take huge amounts of risk. Now, those employees who are still working on the front line, and we'll probably hear from other people here today about that, their willingness to feel vulnerable 
uh, to take a risk, to go into frontline in the pharmacy or in a hospital or on the railways or in the fire or essential services, their willingness to do what their leaders are asking them is dependent on the extent to which they think their leaders care about them and have good motives towards them. So that is why trust is so important in a crisis. And fundamentally, what we're finding out in COVID is you're only as good as you go into this crisis um, in the sense that if you haven't worked at trust over the last 10 years, you can't build it suddenly in response to a crisis. You've either got it there or you haven't. There's a wonderful Dutch phrase, which is trust comes on foot and leaves on horseback. Trust takes a long time to build up. And what the research showed after the financial crisis that I did, and again, that I'm conducting in this crisis, is that those that are responding well, those that can empower their workforces quickly, those that are actually thinking about their supply chains and the small to medium sized businesses in those supply chains, those that are thinking about the communities have worked on being trustworthy leaders and trustworthy organizations over the last 10 years. You can't magic it up like that. You've either got it going into a crisis or you haven't. Yeah. I remember hearing you talk about um, your earlier trust research some time ago, and you talked about it. I, I made a point of remembering this, of it involving benevolence, integrity, consistency, and competence. Mm -hmm. And what I really liked about that model is this is stuff people do and how they do it. And I just wondered, you know, what are you seeing in the people that you interviewed after the uh, financial crisis or the people that you're interviewing right now in terms of how they manifest those qualities? How do they show benevolence, integrity, competence, and consistency? So after the financial crisis, really the big question that people were asking, Margaret, was about benevolence. Can we actually believe that businesses and business leaders care about anyone other than themselves or shareholder value? So the big question after the financial crisis was demonstrate benevolence to your employees and into communities. And we had the rise of, you know, CSR. Um, I think what we're seeing in this crisis is actually i think organizations are demonstrating benevolence uh, but it's a very mixed experience i mean what's coming through is uh, and we've got to face this full on because it's got real consequences for the next six months is there has been an incredibly varied experience in the workforce so some people are working from home, you know, they're being allowed to combine family and caring responsibilities, and that's wonderful. But there are a section of people in many, many workforces who have not had that choice, who have had to go back in. And I'm not talking just about care workers. I'm talking about the part-time workers in pharmacies who couldn't stop going to work. Obviously, we're talking about the health, the health and the care workers in care homes. But we're also talking about people who had to keep the branches of banks open and actually the risks they were taking. And, you know, firms are trying to be benevolent by giving extra payments, extra bonus payments to those frontline workers. But there's going to be questions going forwards about that variable lumping experience. The integrity piece, in some ways, I think this current crisis has shone a, a, a spotlight onto senior leaders' motives even more than before. And uh, I, I was interviewing a chief finance officer from one of Britain's major, major employees, major industries. And I said, how did you make these decisions about the shareholders and about your employees? And he said, because it was the right thing to do. And I said, well, What's the right thing in your organization? And he said, well, you don't get to be employed here at a senior level unless you understand the integrity and what you have to do and what is the right thing. So I think, I think the integrity in a way is coming through uh, 
more strongly than it did in the financial crisis. Mm. I think predictability and reliability at the moment, people are forgiving businesses. They realize that a lot of businesses, and this has come through from the interviews, a lot of businesses have been hanging on the BBC five o'clock briefings from the government trying to work out what's going to happen in the next 24 hours or what they need to do overnight. I mean, it's been quite extraordinary. So I think people have been quite forgiving of, of if you like, the unpredictability of the situation. But the one that will come to bite us over the next six months, and of course, is being asked of government as well, is this ability and competence. So who actually not only was benevolent and, and, and acted with integrity, but who had, which senior teams had the ability and the competence to manage this well. And I think that's going to be questioned over the next six months uh, as we come out of this crisis, but into it, it, arguably a worse stage of uh, restart, recovery, but almost inevitably recession. Yeah. and with some difficult consequences for employees and workforces. Yeah, I'm really minded as you say that, that of course we talk about the COVID crisis because that's very much front of mind. But as you say, we're going to go into an economic crisis and we are already in a climate crisis. So is there anything you have seen um, on the part of companies, leaders, executives, employees, um, that, that we can learn from, since we're going to be stuck in crisis for quite a long time, in terms of what makes their organizations resilient? So we know from the research that was done in the financial crisis that uh, obviously there's what you go into a crisis with, so the levels of trust that you're holding at the moment, that will be important. Do have people seen in this immediate crisis that have they seen evidence of benevolence, integrity and ability and competence? Mm. But other things that came through from the financial crisis is the honesty and transparency with which senior managers explain to their employees, to their customers and to their suppliers the decisions that they're having to take and the extent to which they are willing to share the data and the reasoning behind those decisions. So having collapsed command and control during the crisis, having relied on people to be adult and empowered on the, these front lines mm -hmm. to take responsibility for their decisions, you can't suddenly, when the bad stuff starts, Margaret, <laughs> resort back to going, well, uh, you know, I can't explain to you why I'm making you redundant because I've got special information that I can't share with you. We're going to have to go into, a, we're going to have to maintain that level of adult conversation, empowerment, and explaining to people why those decisions are being taken. The other thing that I think will have to persist is they've had to push leadership down through the organization as we've gone through this crisis. They couldn't manage with anything but distributed leadership. Now, if they then again, try and take decision making back up to the senior levels, I think they'll make a mistake. Mm -hmm. What we found in the financial crisis is the real leaders, the ones that are really trusted in an organization are the local managers, your local mm -hmm. line manager. And the senior managers are, as we go into the recession, are gonna to have to work very, very carefully, considerately with those line managers so that those line managers maintain a benevolence and an integrity with their immediate team mm. that's one of the big learnings it's it's you've got to distribute the leadership as you go into a very very difficult recessionary situation yeah. and the other thing i think is that you know there's going to have to be a conversation about what work is going to look like for all of us post covid mm. what are the elder generation going to do to make sure that there's employment for the younger generation you know we've had there's there's a varied experience within workforces already but there's also this variance in generational experiences 
and there will be questions asked in the workplace about the extent to which the young are going to be asked to carry the brunt of this economic recession. Uh, and there's going to have to be questions around skills provision and actually should elderly people or older people get out of the workforce to make opportunities for younger people. Um, so that's what we learned from the last crisis, having real conversations about employment, skills, opportunities for the workforce, uh, and trying to even up this variability that we've experienced through this crisis. Yeah. What's the very best example or expression of resilience that you've seen so far? Um, in terms of what I've been uh, really impressed by, um, with a number of the businesses that I've spoken to, is uh, the resilience to know what your values are, to know what your compass points were before you went into this crisis, and take your decisions in terms of those moral compass points. Um, I've seen this particularly um, expressed very well to me in um, uh, Nationwide uh, and um, I think BAE Systems are doing some really good work as well in the way that they're not furloughing staff, for instance, because they're in receipt of government contracts. Mm. So, so being resilient and being fair in how they deal with this. but the most extraordinary stories, I have to say, Margaret, coming from the local authorities, Northumberland County Council, working with all those local services, health, fire, and other emergency services, how they have dealt with the complexity of that situation is extraordinary. But the thing that moved me absolutely the most, and I'm a, I've been researching for 36 years and I was almost in tears with this, was the description of the Salvation Army's activity in their hostels and in their care homes. Um, and with very, very little money going in there and the risks and the commitment and the resilience that those frontline workers have shown in hostels and care homes was almost, you know, it, well, it really did move me to tears. And these are the things we're going to find out about as we come out of that immediate crisis. And as a society, there is going to be a call for an evening. If we're going to trust each other as a society, then how are we going to even up some of the poorest paid frontline workers mm -hmm. from either healthcare, local authority care, or the charity sector. Um, boy, has there been resilience there, Margaret, um, with very little protection and very little income uh, yeah. behind the people that have shown it. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Veronica. I'd like to um, move next to talk to Chris May. Chris is Chief Executive of Maiden. The company produces software for healthcare services. So it's a business, it's very much front of mind for all of us, probably more than it ever has been. And a moment when its market is probably kind of heating up to a degree that you know, many entrepreneurs can only dream of. But the really remarkable thing about Maiden, from my point of view, is the way that it's structured and the way that it runs. Chris, I wonder if we could just start off by talking a little bit about the ethos of Maiden, how you structured it, and why you structured it that way. And you'll need to take yourself off mute. <laughs> so I was going to be prepared for that too. And well, I, what um, can I say, a technology CEO. <laughs> I, was so, I was so busy hanging on your every word. Um, yeah, so, um, Let's just go back. I think we've always, ha always had an ethos of wanting to run a company properly and, and be a very special company. But actually, um, I think the roots of where Maiden is today um, started about three years ago when we did a staff survey, which we do um, on a regular basis. We, we, we take soundings from the staff. And um, this staff survey 
didn't produce a very good result. Our ratings on a whole range of measures had gone down um, quite significantly. And that was a big concern for us. And so we kind of embarked on a program of reinventing ourselves. And we've created, um, to cut a long story short, we've created an organization that um, works on agile principles and is very flat structured. And you know there were no managers um, at Maiden. Um, everybody works in self-managing teams. Um, we have a whole series of coaches to support the staff. And, um, and there's lots of kind of aspects to it, but we kind of got ourselves to a place now where um, uh, I think the latest, you know, what, what's happened recently has really shown that we've set ourselves up to be resilient in, in a crisis like this. And I think, you know, going back to the beginning of, um, of, of when the crisis started, I've never heard of a company that planned for a pandemic. So if a company's been resilient at all, it's because they are resilient in a generic sense or um, because they just happen to be in um, a good place within their market. I think you're absolutely right. Uh, Maiden um, is resilient for both those reasons. Um, I think we're in healthcare, which has been a resilient sector to be in. Um, and we also have set ourselves up in a way that actually we were able to continue working more or less without skipping a beat. Right. Um, so how much have you had to change in what you do or how you do things uh, because of the crisis? Very little. So, um, I, I mean, I was making some notes as Veronica was speaking. And what was quite interesting um, is some of the, and I agree with everything Veronica said before I, before I start, but some of the language is quite interesting. So she referred to, um, you know, phrases like top of the organizations about leadership, about empowering the workforce, about local line managers. But actually imagine you've got an organization where actually you don't have any of that because everybody knows what they've got to do. They're actually already empowered. Um, they don't have to rely on their line managers to tell them what to do because they already know what it is supposed to uh, supposed to be doing. Um, when we went into lockdown, we were in something called a mid sprint, which is a kind of two week package of work, which everybody was working on. Um, we left the office at five o'clock on one day and we started up at all working from home at nine o'clock the next day. And literally they just carried on as, as if nothing has happened. They are self managing teams, so they know what the agenda is, they know what the roadmap is. And so they were just able to continue. So this kind of, um, this sort of assumption that, um, that most organisations adhere to, which is that it's a hierarchy and therefore everybody has to suddenly look to their leaders to say, what do we do in a crisis? Um, ideally shouldn't apply. And in Maiden, we found that um, to a large extent it didn't um, mm -hmm. because everybody just carried on and, um, and the leaders didn't have to respond because we were, um, you know, we were already in that mode of thinking. Um, the one thing we had to do um, I think, um, and this is where the leaders did, did come in, uh, we had to remove the fear um, as much as we were able to. So I think although we were able to continue functioning, um, what, we, what we had to do was address people's concerns about income, about being furloughed, um, particularly about childcare when the schools closed. I think that was our biggest crisis point uh, in, in as much as we had one, um, because obviously people find it very difficult to work from home if they're looking after small children as a number of our staff had um, and and I think that's where that benevolence piece comes in that Veronica was talking about um, we did um, make it clear to everybody straight away that we would pay everybody on their full salary for the foreseeable future so they didn't have to worry about any short-term cash flows and we also set up a benevolent fund um, because actually, even though all our staff were okay, many of them had partners who lost their jobs at the beginning of lockdown. And so as a family, they were struggling um, potentially. So we kind of created a safety net for the families to make sure that, um, you know, that fear of financial hardship was taken away for, for everybody. Um, there's obviously um, wasn't a huge amount we can do about other fears about COVID and skills, et cetera, but where, where we could act, we did. Yeah. Well, I think it's quite interesting because in a crisis, of course, there's often a great temptation to, to reassure people actually beyond one's capacity to deliver. So there's always this very fine judgment, isn't there, that you want to reassure people, but you can't tell them everything's going to be okay because you simply don't know. 
Uh, that, <laughs> that's absolutely true. Um, and you know, as we plan to come out of lockdown, I'm looking to the future now and thinking, I really don't know what's going to happen. It, it'd be nice if it's one big wave and it's all tailing off and we can start to plan to go back into the office. Um, but as, as I guess all of you are, we're reading widely about the predictions about what the future is going to be like. And it is very uncertain. Um, you know, certainly I wouldn't be looking forward 400 days at the moment. Um, <laughs> and, um, you know, and in terms of plan for the office, we're, we've got no fuss plans to go back in the foreseeable future. It certainly won't be until the schools go back. Um, but I'm reading lots about a potential second wave over the winter months. So it seems a bit, um, you know, crazy to be planning in detail for this all to be over when actually everything I'm reading says it's not going to be. We're actually going to be in a period of uncertainty for quite some time. And what we've got to do is constantly be agile and adapting to things week by week. And as you said, the government rules are changing on an almost daily basis sometimes, and we've had to respond to that. Um, even to the point that I'm completely confused about the logic of some of the rules that are now in place and what we can and can't do. Um, but um, yeah, I, I think, um, you know, we will just keep adapting and we, we're working, as a company, we work on a two week cycle. Um, so we set work on two-week cycles and our planning for COVID at the moment will continue to be on a sort of two-week cycle as well. I know that, you know, a very big part of a company's resilience, it derives from the sense of connection and solidarity between people. So not in a hierarchical basis, but just in terms of how much do people care about their co-workers, you know, how much... Um, kind of trust and benevolence and generosity do they feel for each other? Because we know that a great deal of what motivates people at work is their co-workers. What have you been able to do or what have you observed in terms of the way that all of the people within Maiden are supporting each other? Um, well, and, and, and what's really, I think one of the great stories about this is that I've not had to do very much at all. Um, all of the team have done it themselves. So. Um, people have created um, pub quizzes in the evening. We've created a Good Morning Maiden hangout, which everyone can go on. We've got a kitchen hangout, which kind of replaces the kind of coffee machine kind of chat, which anyone can go on at any time during the day if they just want to speak to somebody. Um, there's actually a bingo night tonight, which has been organised by somebody else. And, um, and in terms of looking out for each other, um, that has that started from day one and, it, and everybody was involved. If somebody seemed to go quiet or off the grid, it was immediately picked up and we chased, chased it up. And, and actually the, the pastoral care, if you like, happens within the teams. It's not a management thing. It's uh, the teams look after themselves and make sure um, that everybody's okay. If somebody isn't and they think they want to escalate it and get help for somebody, then they did do. Um, so there was all sorts of things that we put in place to make sure that nobody got left out um, of this. Um, I think one of, the, um, one of the more difficult things has been recruiting during the crisis because you're bringing on staff and, um, and, and trying to onboard them in a remote environment and that's been tricky but we've also been doing that and so far what I've picked up is that the people who have joined us over the last three months um, feel just as part of the team as, as they would have done had, had they been in the office, albeit they've never met any, any of them in the flesh so far. And they've never been in the office, have they? No, no they've not seen the building at all. No. Yeah, fantastic. What a great story. You must be very pleased you made those changes three years ago. I'm really pleased and obviously um, not because of what's happened with the pandemic, but actually um, the whole morale and and atmosphere within the company and the way of working and productivity and just general happiness levels, I think, are at the highest that they've ever been. And that was before. So we went into the pandemic in a, in a very kind of strong position, I think, as far as all that's concerned. Um, yeah. I think we've got some um, trials coming out um, of, of it. Um, I'm sort of taking soundings constantly about where people are at and within um, the whole staff base, we've got people who are actually quite scared of COVID 
um, of the disease itself and are very concerned about coming back into an office environment. And at the other extreme, we've got people who are really missing their co-workers and that kind of physical presence. And everybody else, including myself, is kind of on the, somewhere on that spectrum in the middle. Yeah. No, I think, you know, I think you're, in a way, you're echoing what Veronica said, which is there is no single narrative around this crisis. And although, you know, very quickly, early on in the crisis, everyone leapt to a rather sort of sentimental, isn't it great, we're all in this together, you know, sense of solidarity. I think the truth is that the belief that it's a single narrative is deeply, deeply misleading. And, you know, one of the things I've been saying to leaders I work with is don't assume, ask, you know, ask people what their experience has been, because um, what it's been for you may not at all be what it's been for them. Yeah, I think that's absolutely true. Um, I mean, if I can finish on one thing, which you, you might find interesting is, um, you know, we're we're an organisation of 90 people and um, a lot of the organisations Veronica are talking about are much larger than that. Um, and we work in mental health and we are expecting a mental health tsunami. So what actually happened at the beginning of lockdown was referrals into our NHS mental health service actually dropped by about two thirds. So, you know, very significant. Um, but as with the tsunami, the wave first goes out before it comes back in again. And so what we're now seeing is that the referrals into mental health services are picking up and we're expecting, you know, to be a huge wave going forward. And just to put that in some kind of context, you know, we've had 65,000 um, people die um, during this pandemic uh, in terms of excess deaths, not all of COVID, some of other diseases. Um, that's 65,000 bereaved families and friends. Um, there have been lots of other COVID victims on top of that, some of whom are still suffering from symptoms or post-viral um, fatigue or whatever. Um, there is the ongoing fear of the disease. Domestic abuse rates have gone through the roof. Um, the divorce rate is up quite significantly. Homelessness has increased. Um, the economic impact on all of the 3 million unemployed that we've now got, which is um, destined to reach 4 million, uh, according to the latest predictions. Um, our children and young people were already a bit fragile when it came to resilience and of course this has had a huge impact on them and then there's all the education impact of you know missing um, you know an important part. Um, most organisations will have employees who are victims of some or, or you know, one or more of those things. And so um, we mustn't forget that everybody is an individual and they're all impacted separately by all of these different pressures that I, we're going to be experiencing over the next year or so. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Chris. And it's a sort of perfect segue to introduce our next panelist, uh, Minou Irani. Minou is medical director of the Berkshire Health Foundation Trust. It's a mental health trust, and Minou has been involved during the crisis, both with providing mental health help to the population at large, but also, of course, to the NHS workforce. Minu, I wonder if you could just describe what you were able to provide, both for the population at large, at a time when you know, the NHS was very embroiled in, in COVID, but also for your own workforce, which of course was, was really bearing the brunt of the crisis. Thank you, Margaret. Um, um, ju just, just a slight addition. We are a mental health and community health combined trust. Um, so, so, so we do both uh, aspects of healthcare, and both are relevant in, in this current situation. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of uh, mental health, uh, we we did see a significant reduction in demand during the lockdown period, and um, I think no one is as yet clear what the reason for that is, um, because mental health conditions don't go away uh, during lockdown. So we assume there is a pent up um, sort of need sitting sitting somewhere. Um, we did um, quite rapidly respond to um, what was sort of partial national guidance, but also the right thing to do locally. So. Um, we did not stop any of our services. We just uh, we just approached um, the delivery of our services in a different manner. And you know, listening to to, to Chris, um, a lot of this was because of our technological maturity in our organisation. So we could do a remote um, assessments uh, where uh, they were clinically safe uh, for for the population uh, when when 
when, um, uh, when, when people felt a little bit anxious about coming into healthcare environments. Um, and, and we were able to keep a level of service ongoing besides, of course, our inpatient mental health uh, site, which was uh, fully running. So that was a population level um, um, offer which continued. We expect um, the need to um, significantly increase um, as, as, as time goes on and, and some of the uh, after effects unravel, um, we're already seeing a, a, a peak in demand uh, happening. So I don't think it's going to be long before we come to that. Um, but alongside, and this is because we were fortunate, we had a, a significant uh, workforce of senior psychologists and, and of course, uh, a significantly larger number of uh, staff trained in psychological therapies that we were able to offer um, uh, a sort of staff well-being um, and support um, um, offer for for our staff, not only our, our staff but also the local acute hospital staff. Um, and 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 I have to I have to say it was a head of psychological therapies who very quickly acted, saying, "Well, this is what we will need for staff well-being uh, because staff who are feeling sort of protected, valued, will." of course, have less sickness and have much more productivity. And that, of course, benefits patients, which, uh, which is the whole idea of this. And um, so uh, we had a sort of a, what we call the anticipatory phase, where we quickly set up a, a, a system of supporting staff. And during the active phase, we had uh, not only training for our frontline managers, because they will be the first people the staff will approach. So how do you how do you manage staff anxiety? How do you give them a safe space to express their um, anxiety, some of their stress in, in the situation? Um, we also set up a, um, a staff helpline so they could call um, actually anonymously. They didn't even have to reveal who they were. And that was just mainly to provide signposting, um, what we call psychological first aid, uh, and nothing more than that. But if they required more, um, and that is just a sort of tip of the pyramid, you would say, uh, in an active phase of, of any crisis, uh, they would get uh, full psychological support. And then um, the next level was actually team-based support. So that was going out to teams and saying, if a whole team requires a debrief or, or support, uh, we have um, a senior experienced psychologists who will come out and do that. And that helps teams to remain cohesive and and, and debrief themselves in a much more sort of safe environment as a result of the crisis. So, um, so, so, so that is how we sort of implemented. I think there is a lot of work to do. Uh, we don't expect this is the end of our uh, process, so to say. We are in the recovery phase now, which is supporting um, services staff to get back to where uh, where services were before we left off. Of course, we don't expect services to be exactly the same. We expect things to move on from here on, but with some of the innovations that we've, uh, we've developed. So, um, so all in all, yes, but we had some basics building blocks already in place and that sort of helped us to achieve this. Mm. So during this period, do you think you were able to actually offer more support to NHS staff than you would do typically? Oh yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So um, we are an organization quite focused on staff satisfaction. We've done a lot of work. So that, that formed the basis of, you know, what, what Veronica referred to earlier was a trust, uh, um, uh, uh, sort of from the leadership down to the front line. Uh, but, but during this phase, it was a significantly extra. I mean, we, we have done staff broadcasts uh, every week, uh, besides sort of daily newsletters, which go out about sort of guidance that we expect in, internally, of course, but also national guidance coming out. And, uh, and, and the well-being offer was always at the top of all our broadcasts is, you know, you, you, if you need anything, do come to us. You know, we've got a system set up. So, so it was a significantly greater offer. Mm, mm, fantastic. I mean, it's so interesting because this isn't a story one here is being told about, you know, what was going on. The focus has been so exclusively on COVID and looking after patients. It's really fascinating to hear actually what's going on underneath that to support the people who are supporting the patients, you know. Um, I would just wonder in terms of what you saw going on during this period, was there anything particular about the style of leadership or the ways of communication which you feel were particularly helpful to people? Um, absolutely. So um, 
if I can sort of start with the leadership at the top, um, it's just an artificial start. I could start from the bottom, but uh, um, the board and the executive um, uh, structure, we've been a very stable structure um, for, for several years. So, so, so there is that level of trust again, which uh, Veronica referred to internally among ourselves. Uh, um, and we've got clear lines of responsibility internally now. That is all fine during during peacetime, but when a crisis comes on, it's very, um, it's, it's I wouldn't say very easy, but it is definitely easier to uh, quickly realign our responsibilities to sort of what we had to put in a gold and silver command structure in order to um, uh, support various actions that we had to take. Uh, but that could happen because of our long-standing relationship trust. And I have to say, our CEO has done a lot of work over the years to 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 keep the team sort of together. So it doesn't mean that we agreed with each other all the time. In fact, I didn't agree with a lot of what my colleagues said. I, you know, I was a sort of clinical voice alongside my director of nursing, but, uh, but, but that does not matter as long as you have that level of trust uh, um, at that level. So that was at the senior level, but then there are examples of, of trust and leadership at all levels uh, because, um, you know, I, mean, I guess it's no secret that during a crisis, your standard sort of management uh, structures and processes just won't work. You will require them to sort of take on a level of leadership. And you know, we had it right from the clinical front line um, to our managers. And in a sense, again, of course, we were not prepared for a crisis because no one knew it was coming. But over the last two to three years, we've had a sort of quality improvement program. And one of the top principles of that program is that you allow the front line to come up with the ideas for improvement and take on the leadership mm -hmm. and, and the executive and the board supports that. Uh, so we already had that in place, um, thankfully. Um, and then there was a significant element, I have to say, because of our digital maturity that we could do a number of things. We, we just couldn't have done uh, a significant number of things. It's just starting with our staff communication, our weekly broadcast. We got four and a half thousand staff. Our first broadcast had three and a half thousand staff who logged in. To, to, to listen, to put questions to us. And we've carried that on as fortnightly now because things are sort of less hot. Um, we've had electronic patient records for nearly 10 years. Um, we've been doing our staff meetings through remote means, um, teams. Uh, so, so actually when the crisis hit us, uh, we didn't have to scramble around to sort of get things in place. All we had to say is, okay, if you don't need to come to work, just don't come to the site at all, because the more human traffic you create, there's sort of greater amount of risk and confusion you cause there. And so nearly half of our staff, the back office, uh, the sort of non-frontline staff, and even frontline who are doing virtual clinical assessments uh, uh, by phone or even digital uh, video uh, assessments, could just do that from outside the work environment. And that was a huge relief because um, I can't even imagine what would have happened if we had to start developing all these skills uh, over a period of time. So I guess all of them sort of came together to help us through the crisis. Yeah, fantastic. I mean, I'm also very struck because, you know, what you say resonates with some of the research I've done myself, which is actually the longevity of teams, the degree to which people have been working together really makes a difference in terms of their capacity to adapt and flex quite quickly, doesn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. It does. It, it does. And I, I always wondered, I, I know our CEO was going on that, you know, stable structure always helps. And uh, of course, being the less experienced one, I, I thought, well, yeah, okay. But, you know, new blood is always good. Uh, during these crises, you realize that you do need to have that level of trust and engagement with your colleagues to take you through. Yeah, it's, it's not really the gig economy, is it? <laughs> Thank you so much, Manu. Uh, and last but not least, I'd like to uh, introduce Jeff McDonald, who had a glorious time at Unilever, where he ended up as Global VP for HR. He now works avidly and energetically as a campaigner for mental health at work. Jeff, I wonder if you could talk briefly about your sense of the mental health crisis as you saw it before the pandemic. So what sort of state were organizations in regarding uh, mental health before COVID came on the scene? Uh, thank you, Margaret. And uh, just a big thank you to you for having me on today and to join the other panelists. It's, it's wonderful to listen to these conversations. You know, I think, um, I think um, 
There's a wonderful book uh, written by Professor Jeffrey Pfeffer from Stanford University. And he talks about dying for the paycheck, dying for the paycheck. And, um, you know, I think prior to the pandemic, I think that there, there has been and has continued to be significant issues in organizations around the mental ill health of people. I mean, we've seen the data, we've seen the cost of mental ill health to this country, both in the form of absenteeism and in the form of presenteeism. I think what, the, what COVID-19 has done is in many ways, it has democratized mental ill health. Mm -hmm. It has democratized it. You know, there are very few people out there during this time who have not been feeling symptoms of mental ill health, whether that's increased levels of stress, whether that's really struggling to sleep. And so I think in many ways, you know, I mean, I have been humbled and overwhelmed by the, by the degree to which organizations have begun to reach out to people like me and others to actually begin a conversation around mental ill health amongst their employees. You know, there are parts of the world where I've been, I've been knocking on the door for a couple of years to try and get out there, to get my message across around uh, addressing the stigma of mental ill health. And, and, you know, those countries and those cultures have, have begun to ask for this conversation. So, so I think it's always been there. Mm -hmm. I think that what, the, what COVID-19 has done is it has democratized this and it is and it is allowed it is allowed for this conversation uh to bubble up to the surface mm. yeah what have you seen companies do, doing during the pandemic that has particularly impressed you well I, I mean and i think you know minu and chris have alluded to this and so has veronica uh, you know it has been yes of course you know, business continuity has been essential and there's been a strong focus on business continuity. But alongside that has been a realization of how important it is to address the well-being of people, particularly their mental and emotional health. You know, I mean, we've, we've all heard about the physical effects of COVID-19. I mean, we all know what the physical effects of COVID-19 are, you know, a, you know, a temperature, loss of taste and smell, uh, you know, a dry cough. What we haven't spoken about are the psychological effects of COVID-19. And Chris alluded to some of those, you know, real uncertainty that people are feeling right now, financial insecurity that people are feeling right now, disruption to social connections, you know, changes in the family system. I mean, these are all factors that are contributing and having an impact on the psychological uh, effects of people. And so, and so what I've been impressed by is leaders have reached out to say, yes, we need to focus on business continuity, but unless our people are also feeling uh, healthy, well, and we are providing resources to enhance their well-being at this time, and, and what is it that we can be can we be doing exactly as Manu described as to how you know almost this whole this whole issue of well-being was really elevated. I've been hugely impressed by the way in which companies have done that. And the other thing that I've been very impressed by is those companies. And Veronica uh, alluded to this. And, and you know my pedigree of, of, of working for an organization that was truly, truly purpose-led. And, you know, I've been hugely impressed by organizations that have kind of dusted off that sense of purpose and have begun to make decisions that align to that sense of purpose. You know, and it comes back to what Veronica was saying, you know, doing things because it just feels like the right thing to be doing rather than, well, tell me, what's the business case for why we should do this? Yeah. I mean, there's no business case for a company to give crocs to every single frontline worker. 
there's no business case to donate all these crocs but you know the but it just felt like the right thing to be doing and it felt like it was it was part of the purpose of that organization and so i think as organizations have 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 become more true to that sense of purpose you know i really really have been impressed by that and i think it's those organizations you know you talk about resilience and by the way i i've spent the last <laughs> I've spent the last eight years of my life trying to break the stigma of mental ill health in workplaces and allow for cultures where Manu can, you know, where Manu was talking about, you know, provide a culture where people can come in and just have the conversation and we don't rely on one another to spot symptoms and look out to see whether somebody might be ill or struggling, but people just feel they can talk about the stuff. And, uh, and the word resilience is a bit of a trigger for me because although, Margaret, you were just so wonderful in the way you defined resilience up front, but for me, it often conjures up sort of toughness and, you know, you know I, I'm tough and I'm resilient and I much prefer the word resourceful and how do we make organizations more resourceful? How do we make individuals more resourceful? And, uh, and I think it's those organizations that have shown this resourcefulness and this this desire to, to live out a sense of purpose. I think it's those ones that I've been hugely, hugely impressed by. Yeah, yeah. It's really interesting because at the beginning of the crisis, I remember I drew up a call sheet of people. I thought I need to check in with these people on every week or two weeks because these are people I care about, I work with, you know, some of them completely, you know, locked down on their own. And one of my mentoring, I was telling one of my mentoring clients about this, and he kind of instantly said, right, that's what we've all got to do. You know, so then his whole senior leadership team has its call sheet, and then their people have their call sheets, you know, and, and I was just really interested by the degree to which, you know, good ideas flowed really fast between people and organizations. You know, the thing about virtual pubs or virtual coffee shops or, you know, pub quizzes, this sort of thing. And I just saw a real proliferation of sort of socially supportive behaviors mm -hmm. that you know did make me sit back and think, well, gee, why didn't we, why didn't we do this before? Right? <laughs> I know. And I just, you know, I just wonder how far, you know, there's the famous line, you know, don't waste a crisis. Um, how far you think this is actually a moment where something fantastic could emerge, where we can really reset expectations of organizations and of ourselves yeah. in terms of how we think about and how we um, act on concerns regarding mental health. You know, Margaret, I mean, I, I think COVID-19 provides organizations with that small, small window of opportunity to truly, truly think about, to truly think about how do they begin to elevate the most important driver of an individual team and organizational performance, and that is the health of their people. If I, if I were to say, you know, just hear me out for a minute. I mean, probably, the most important driver of individual team and organization performance is what I call the energy of people. I mean, there's a football club out there called uh, Liverpool. I mean, I don't know where this club has come from, but in the last two years, some guy called Klopp was sort of dropped into it and he brings energy, he brings passion mm. to that football club. I mean, look at how they are performing. Think about that talented people in organizations today. They are the people, and I'm not saying you've all got to be energy bunnies, but they've got this human capacity to kind of get things done. And they do it with fervor, with passion, with energy. And you know what we, where we get our energy from? We get our energy from our health, from being healthy, physically, emotionally, mentally, and spiritually, or a kind of sense of purpose and meaning. That's what I mean by health. Yeah. And so if the health, the energy of our people is the most important asset. I really challenge HR functions and CEOs to tell me people are their most important asset. Well, guess what? It's the energy of people. It's the health of your people that is your most important asset. And if you don't believe me, look at COVID-19. And when people aren't healthy, look what happens too. 
economies around the world. And so is this an opportunity? And I really think it's an opportunity, Margaret. A small window where we begin as an organization to elevate the health of our people to being a strategic priority in that organization and not a well-being week where we have a week where we care for these people for one week of the year and then I flog you to death for the other 51 weeks of the year. Or I've decided to put a few bananas next to the till in the canteen. Do you know what I mean? And we'd have nuts in meeting rooms and guess what? We care for our people. You know, we spend billions in health and safety, don't we? Billions. Well, it all goes to safety. I mean, why can't we also invest some of that money in enhancing the health of our people? And I believe COVID-19 has shown us how important people's health is if they want to be productive, if they want to perform. And so we have a little, little opportunity to really reset and elevate the health of our people to something strategic. And why do I want it to be strategic? Because every other strategic priority in an organization is about enabling performance. And this is the most important performance enabler. And thank you, COVID-19, for proving it. Yeah. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Jeff. Now, we've had some fantastic questions um, from the audience. Um, I want to start with one which I think is, is it's sort of obvious, except we haven't talked about it. And that's a question around diversity, because, of course, in the middle of this crisis, we've also seen the crisis, which is Black Lives Matter. And a real, you know, in the same way that we've seen the issue of health and mental health at work kind of revealed and made more important. I think, you know, most organizations have had to step back and think about really what have they done regarding diversity? What are they going to do? But we had this very interesting question from Desire, who said, was asking what really, wouldn't real diversity, you know, diversity like we really mean it, wouldn't that also be a tremendous amplification of resilience in our organization? And um, so I wonder, Veronica, would you mind posing a response to that? Okay, um, so again, the, uh, uh, the current research I'm doing, I ask a question about the external pressures that have been brought to bear other than COVID and the Black Lives Matter is obviously coming up in every single conversation that I'm having. Um, so to answer uh, the question directly, we know, for instance, <laughs> that diverse teams outperform homogeneous teams as long as you recognize that diversity and work with it. I mean, that's been proven and known for some years. So at a simple level, um, yes, <laughs> diverse teams and diverse opinion and diverse knowledge and diverse experience actually improves teams performance. So on one level, you're absolutely right. The second thing, which is why I think diversity does contribute to resilience, is that, as Jeff has said, COVID-19 has forced us to look at the importance of health, um, mental health and physical health in the workplace. Absolutely. Completely agree with you, Jeff. I think the other thing that COVID-19 has triggered is a real understanding of social inequalities, of who are on the periphery of organizations who are excluded and actually potentially the benefits that would come in from including those on the periphery into our conversations mm. uh, and i think it is that's at an organizational level i think at a third level so you've got the team level we know diverse teams perform better then you've got actually making sure that within an organization, all are included in that conversation. And I think that's happened in COVID. But the third one, which is really important for us, is that if having now ripped the plaster off and we understand the social inequalities that are writ large in multiple societies across this world, unless we as a society start to address those social inequalities, this will have 
tremendous dysfunction for society. Yeah. And I think some of what you've seen in Black Lives Matter is, yes, about Black Lives Matter, but there's also an anger in society generally about what COVID-19 has revealed about people's very, very different experience. So if we want to be resilient as a society, we have to think of how we incorporate everybody and everybody's experience. Yeah. Everybody going forward. Yeah. No, I think also, you know, it's a real test because we have in business been talking about resi uh, diversity for a very, 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 very long time. And we have made very, 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 very little progress. And so I think, you know, coming back to your issue around trust, you know, if we, if, if businesses want to be trusted, then they have to start delivering on some of those promises that they've made and acted on actually very weakly. I'd like to, I think there's also a really interesting theme emerging here, which, um, which is around the kind of democratization that the pandemic brings, both in terms of, you know, everyone facing challenges, albeit differently. And, um, and one of the things I was interested in, Chris, which you said was, you know, which is you're basically, you know, it's not even that you're giving your workforce power, they already have power, you're not kind of getting in the way and impeding it. And one of the questions that we've had is, do you think that's easier with a younger workforce? So are, are younger people happier with that lack of structure? Or do you think it would just suit anybody? In other words, can we democratize work in, you know, with any kind of workforce, do you think? It's actually a really good question because um, what actually happened when we created our structure was the opposite of what I expected. So um, we do employ lots of young people, lots of graduates from the university. And, um, and because we're a tech company, um, it, it tends to be a younger workforce. When we created this structure, I anticipated that all of those people who were sort of middle-aged like me would struggle with it because they'd all been in hierarchical organizations throughout their career and they would find it quite difficult. I thought that the young people would find it really hip and sexy and it would be absolutely fantastic. Actually, what happened initially was the opposite, it was true. Um, all of the older members of staff found it extremely refreshing because all the politics got removed, you know, the kind of holding on to information that generally happened in organisations stopped happening because we had all this transparency. And the people that really struggled with it were the young people. And, and when I look behind that, the reason for that is that actually our education system is quite hierarchical. You know, you do your GSEs, GCSEs, you do your A-levels, you kind of go and get your degree, you get your postgrad. You're already on a ladder even before you enter the workforce and you kind of go into the workforce and you're just kind of looking for the, the next set of rungs. And it's actually quite difficult for um, people coming out of higher education to, to, when you take the ladder away, which is effectively what we did. And... Um, but it was also made worse by the fact that all of these people would get together with all of their peers from the university at weekends, down in the pub or whatever, and their peers would be getting grander and grander job titles, you know, so they would, they'll, you know, within a year they'd all be yeah. vice president or something. And that really made our staff, I think, initially feel, um, you know, that they were kind of not progressing in their, their career as much. Mm. So... We've had to deal with that and, um, you know, and, and really trying to, you know, trying to get the young people's mindsets in, in, in a very, very different frame um, has been quite a challenge. Um, but yeah. I think we're there now. How interesting. How interesting. We've had a really good question here, um, which I'd like to pose to Manu and then to Jeff, which is... Um, you know, after this period of really intense, intense, intense work, um, what do you see organi your organization doing to try to get people to uh, disconnect, to kind of change the pace? Because, you know, people have, I think to use your word, you know, they've been running quite hot for quite a long time. Um, what, would, what is your experience or what would your advice be in terms of, kind of helping people to change gear? 
Yes, um, I think we've been we've been sort of thinking about this um, for a while. Is what is the sort of rest phase or the uh, what some psychologists call you're sort of in the neutral zone after the sort of active uh, hot work you've done, and, and, and how do you how do you manage that? Um, uh, so uh, there are a number of um, sort of standard assurance um, uh, work that has been, um, in, in a sense, not 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 um, removed, but um, cut down. So some of the medical appraisals have made light touch. Uh, some of the revalidation, the five-year MOT, as people would call it, have got extension. So um, there are a number of background uh, policy changes which have been made so as that frontline doctors, nurses, therapists can focus on uh, the, the work and then have some period of time. We are encouraging staff to take leave. There is a natural tendency not to take leave, a sense of guilt that we have to carry on working at the same time, well, particularly where do we go now type of thing. So uh, that has been a regular uh, focus for us. Um, uh, but, um, but of course, you know, the, the, that sort of uncertainty remains is uh, why do we have to do the recovery of going back to establishing, re-establishing our services. Um, we just don't know what winter has for us. That, that, that level of caution is there. Uh, but, uh, but that's why we sort of continue with, uh, you know, the wellbeing program has a whole recovery phase is, you know, we will support you, you know, well, it's going to go on for another couple of years. That's what the prediction is. So we, we are there as an organization, uh, right from the top leadership. Um, uh, but, but yes, it is a challenging, it is a challenging period for us and will be for, for a while. Yeah, it's interesting. I work with a number of NHS leaders and I'm so impressed that in the last month or two, well, actually the last month, I would say, they've all taken time off. And I just think, wow, that's actually quite a difficult thing to do and, and really impressive. You know? Jeff, I wonder what, what you've seen, you know, what I mean, people talk about being zoomed out you know, of being stuck on their laptops all day long. Yeah. Um, some of us are completely guilty of that right now. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I'm, I've also, you know, I sit on boards of companies who are saying, wow, this is really amazing. People are working from home and productivity has gone up. To which my instant response is, just be careful what you wish for here, you know, because you can't tell whether this is people working because they love it, because they're at home, because they have more time, or if they're working out of fear, you know, fear of losing their jobs, or just because, you know, keeping busy is a way of, of dealing with, with so much uncertainty. So what have you seen to help yeah. um, people manage this? Yeah. Margaret, can I just share a little slide and try to answer that question? And hopefully everybody can see the slide. Um, but, but let, me, let me try and answer that question just from two points of view. The first point of view is, is, is at an organizational level. And, and I think Minu has kind of described some of the stuff that they want to, that the organization wants to do to encourage people, you know, to, to take time out and to recover. I, and I'm a bit of a dreamer, all right? But you know what I'd love to see organizations do more of? Is as part of the development of their people, why don't we have conversations about people's health? You know, why don't we, why don't, why don't line managers, leaders, as part of the development of their people, ensure that all of their people have got a well-being plan, mm -hmm. not just a skills development plan or a coach to help them with their behaviors or the right experience. Why don't organizations begin to see the well-being piece as critical driver of performance and therefore providing the kinds of resources Minu has been talking about so that people can draw on those resources to maintain and look after their health. And you know, what do I mean by health? And this is not my meaning, this is the Warwick Edinburgh work around health, which is our physical health, our emotional health, our mental health, and having that sense of purpose and meaning. And so, yes, I think there's, a, there's that organizational responsibility and to begin to introduce development conversations and conversations with people about their health. And guess what? When I have a conversation about your physical health, one of the things I want you to do is to recover. Recovery is a critical, I want you to go, as a line manager, I want to encourage you to take some time out to recover. Mm. I think at an individual level, Margaret, I think that the, I think, I think that 
I think what we as individuals have to do, and you know, I can give you all the little tips around how to look after your physical, emotional, mental, you know, having a sense of purpose. But I think, I think, I think it's about mindset at an individual level. Mm-hmm. And it's about where is my health in the list of my priorities? Mm-hmm. And I yeah. can, and you know, Margaret, my crucible moment in life, when I got very ill with anxiety, fuel, depression, that crucible moment taught me that the most important priority in my life is my health. And because I prioritize it, I find 60 minutes every single day to do things that help to enhance my physical, emotional, mental, and by God, I've got a sense of purpose in my life. And, and unless, and unless, and, and so I'm not, you know, the fact that we've got to work people to death and then give them time off to go and recover. How can we encourage people every single day to just take 15, 20, 30 minutes? You know, I think it was the air steward who once taught me if this airplane is going down and the oxygen mask falls and your daughter's sitting next to you, who do you put the oxygen mask on first? You put it on yourself first and then you put it on your daughter. And I think this mindset of an oxygen mask on ourselves, unless we have that mindset at an individual level and take that accountability to maintain and look after our health, you know, it's, it, I don't, I don't think we do all these things that people say you should be doing. And yeah. so I think it, it, so there's a piece around the organizational level around having these well-being health conversations with our people as part of their development. And then I think as individuals, it's about the mindset. Where's that oxygen mask? Is it always on other people or are you going to stick it on yourself first so that you can be good at putting it on other people? Yeah. I mean, I think the other thing that's quite interesting here is that um, you know many organizations still find it very difficult to appreciate that productivity isn't measured in hours. You know that actually, and we've been studying productivity since 1888, right, the first ever productivity study, and we you know and every study we do shows exactly the same thing, which is productivity starts to tap out around 40 hours a week, and the reason isn't because people can't work more than that. It's that when they do work more than that, they get tired. And when they get tired, they make mistakes. And now you need all that extra time to clear up the mess that they've made. And I think we're still stuck in what I think of as a kind of old industrial revolution manufacturing mindset, which says, well, surely if I can make, you know, one of these in one hour, then surely I can make 10 of these in 10 hours. But actually if over 10 hours, two of them are broken, you know, you haven't made a great, a great leap forward. Um, I just want to ask really one question of each of you before we have to wind up, which is, um, you know, very much picking up Jeff's point about what he does, you know, to keep himself healthy. If each of you could just share with us, please, one thing you do or have done during this pandemic to maintain or even build up your own resilience. Um, Chris, I wonder if we could start with you. Um, I'm eating much better. So um, certainly I've improved my nutrition. One of the first things we did in lockdown is um, one of our staff organised a speaker to talk to everybody on a Zoom call about looking after themselves while working at home. And um, she covered everything that Jeff just talked about, actually, um, physical and mental health and nutrition and and uh, all sorts of things. And I tried to put that into place. So I'm eating much better. Um, my alcohol consumption, unlike most people, has actually gone down during the pandemic. I've discovered I'm more of a social drinker. Um, I don't like to drink alone. And I generally, um, I do a high intensity workout every morning, which I wasn't doing. And I generally get an hour's walk in um, every day, um, just out of the fresh air and have been doing that since lockdown. And that's actually good thinking time as well. And it just switch off. Um, but I haven't yet solved the problem of how to avoid endless Zoom calls. <laughs> nothing, nothing personal. But, uh... right. Fair Veronica, what have you found is helpful? Okay, so um, two things. One is I don't think I would have survived without my dog because actually my dog gave me a reason to go out every single day and it needed exercise. And without doubt, that has helped. 
I would add in a little word of caution. Uh, I did actually, I've never suffered from migraines in my life and actually had a severe migraine. It turned out to be a migrainous attack. Uh, this was about, I don't know, three or four weeks in. And frankly, I wasn't used to this much screen time because most of my meetings in pre-COVID are face-to-face -face meetings. I don't spend a lot of time in front of screens. Uh, so a word of caution, I now, you know, try really hard to have some stuff that's a phone calls um, and just to have gaps in my diary because I do think too much screen time is not doing any of us that much good. Mm. Um, so that's it, get a dog, <laughs> walk the dog and find yourself some time during the working day that doesn't involve engaging with the screen. Yeah, great. Minu? What's, what's kept you going during this period? Um, it is, it is finding um, at least an hour to, to, to go out. We've got a beautiful Reading University campus, not, not, not in more than three minutes away, walking distance from my house. But uh, previously, even though I used to work maybe less hours than during the last three months, I mean, it's been sort of nearly 14 hours a day, but I still um, did find some time just to go out into their horticultural garden, which is just an amazing, peaceful place. Uh, it has become a little bit crowded, of course, uh, because uh, several people have the same idea. Uh, and of course, um, um, sitting down with the family for, for at least one meal. I mean, again, that was a luxury in the past. Maybe on a weekend we could do that now. We sort of made it almost a discipline that even the children are at home from school. So um, one meal a day. And it does, it, does, it does help. It does help to unwind. Great. Well, thank you all very, very much for your insights, for your wisdom, for your honesty. That sadly is the last of the Dean's webinar series, Business as Unusual. I hope you've all found them helpful, provocative, challenging. For now, let me just say thank you all for joining in. Um, and I wish you a creative, fruitful, resourceful, and resilient rest of the summer. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>